this morning. We'll be starting in uh, just a few moments. Our session today covers AWS and the semiconductor industry. Uh, how we can help increase the pace of innovation, uh, get chips to market faster, some of the capabilities that we have at AWS to enable uh, rapid chip development, uh, in particular, electronic design automation. I'm joined here by Tim Thornton, Director of ARM-based engineering for ARM Limited. He'll talk about ARM's own experiences in uh, increasing their pace of innovation for ARM-based uh, processors. So let's start by talking about uh, EDA specifically, but I wanted to really characterize uh, how Amazon fits in this ecosystem first. I mean, Amazon uh, actually is a fabulous semiconductor company. We develop uh, a number of chips uh, every year, including advanced node uh, silicon used in our data centers, uh, devices that we have, of course, that you're all very familiar with uh, based on systems on chip uh, developed at Amazon. So we care deeply about this industry. We're part of it. Uh, we're part of the supply chain and we, uh, we benefit from rapid innovation as do our customers. A few examples of the types of chips that are developed at Amazon, uh, ranging uh, in particular in the AWS uh, portion of the business, uh, Graviton 2 ARM-based servers, we'll hear, be hearing more about those uh, later in this session. Uh, those are advanced node, uh, seven nanometer, uh, quite uh, complex uh, systems on chip developed in collaboration with ARM. We also have deep learning inference chips, the Inferentia chips, and uh, uh, chips that are used in our networking and uh, virtualization infrastructure, the Nitro system that you may have heard about uh, as part of our latest generation of EC2 instances. And all of these are developed using cloud for electronic design automation to increase our pace of innovation, uh, get to tape out faster. So when we hear from customers in this sector, uh, what their motivations are for using cloud, we consistently hear innovation as being the top theme, right? Getting to market faster, taking more uh, risks, experiments, uh, really having the ability to, uh, to verify and to design at higher scales. Again, to keep engineers busy, innovating faster, doing what they do best. Collaboration is also very important. I'll touch on that in a moment, how you can work with third parties in a secure way using cloud. And risk mitigation. I'll give you an example of that uh, at MediaTek in a few moments and other customers that are using cloud to reduce their tape out risks. And then of course, cost reductions that are possible in cloud. When you think about running design and verification workloads on AWS, electronic design automation workloads, you can really visualize uh, this in the same way that you might in on-premise infrastructure. Uh, EDA on the cloud does not have to look fundamentally different than it does on-premise. You have the ability to use remote desktops, create license managers and, and scheduling environments for batch workloads. You can automatically scale, however, in order to meet the needs of your, of your job workflows, right? To scale up, scale down, optimize instance types, optimize storage architectures. And we also have architectures in common use today that bridge to on-premise infrastructure. If you have substantial uh, EDA environments on-premise, you can connect those out to cloud, and we have examples of how to do that. Uh, on the analytics side, a very important benefit for running EDA on cloud is that you can now connect your EDA, your engineering environments, in the analytics uh, systems. For example, capturing job logs uh, from large back wor batch workloads, making more intelligent decisions about resource management, uh, license utilization, and so forth. And we have examples of customers doing exactly that today. I touched on collaboration briefly, and that's super important across this ecosystem. Uh, this can be a topic of an entire uh, session. Uh, in the future, perhaps we'll do a webinar on the topic of collaboration. The idea here is that by using cloud, you can now create much more secure environments for managing IP. Whether you're a fabulous semiconductor uh, company that is working with an EDA vendor or an IP provider, or perhaps you're on the foundry side and you need to do uh, things like IP merge or communicate PDKs to your customer. These are all made possible by cloud by creating a secure chambered environments on cloud, whether they're single tenant within your own organization or perhaps multi-tenant in the case of a collaboration chamber. Again, this is a topic we can go much deeper on, but it's a very important trend now in uh, higher quality uh, chip design, 
uh, maintaining security across a disaggregated supply chain. I want to talk now in more te te detail about to EDA and then turn it over to Tim who talked about their experiences at ARM. If we think about the entire silicon design workflow, the front end design, the back end side, and all the way back to production, there's many different com computationally and data intensive workflows required to get a chip out uh, to market today, to get a tape out into manufacturing. These include uh, functional simulation, mixed signal simulations, physical synthesis, various types of physical verification, including timing analysis, design rule check, power analysis, right? And then back in the production side, computational lithography is becoming more and more important in advanced nodes. Most of these workloads, in fact, all of them today, are excellent uh, fit for cloud because with cloud, you can choose the type of architectures that are needed, whether it's server types or storage architectures, and scale up and scale down to get these workloads done much, much faster. And we're seeing, in particular, the back-end design, physical verification, and also areas like library characterization that require large amounts of compute for short amounts of time moving rapidly to cloud. And cloud really is becoming the new sign-off platform for the ty these types of workloads. Drilling down a little bit deeper, think about using cloud to optimize each of these points of the EDA flow. Uh, choosing the right instance types, for example, whether you need uh, a larger amount of memory per core, or perhaps you need uh, to cost optimize by scaling out uh, lots and lots of uh, lower cost instances. You have more choices on cloud than you normally would have in an on-premise EDA infrastructure. This is one of the most important benefits of running cloud. And this also extends all the way back to the production side. If you're doing things like yield analysis, computational lithography, or perhaps using IoT to capture data from, from foundry equipment or in the test environments, we have the ability now to extend the cloud out into the on-premise world using IoT services, very important component of a full semiconductor design and manufacturing flow. MediaTek is an outstanding example of a customer that has taken advantage of cloud, in this case, to, uh, to verify static timing analysis of uh, a very large uh, seven nanometer advanced node uh, 5G cell phone chip. And they talked about this at our reInvent conference uh, last year. We have uh, the ability to provide you a recording if you're interested in watching that uh, with more details on the solution. But in a, in a course of, of the tape out, a static timing analysis is a very, very important workload. And it's actually a very large workload for advanced node designs. In this case, they use 12 million core hours of computing in a short burst of two months to get that chip verified and out to market. They met their schedule, a very successful uh, completion of that project enabled using cloud. More recently, the Graviton 2 processors, the ARM-based uh, instances available in AWS, are beginning to find their way into EDA workloads. We do have uh, EDA vendors and customers, including ARM, of course, now using the ARM-based uh, M6G, and now the R R6G and, and C6G also available for EDA flows. And, and Tim's going to touch on that in a few moments. We're very excited about uh, what we're doing with ARM in the, uh, in the Graviton 2 processors. Uh, these uh, were entirely developed by our own internal silicon teams at Amazon uh, using cloud for the entire EDA float. I'm going to turn this over to Tim Thornton now, Director of ARM-based Engineering, to talk about how they're using ARM instances, Graviton2, to develop ARM processors on AWS. Uh, take it away, Tim. Thanks, Dave. So by way of introduction, um, ARM has historically been known for our mobile and our embedded processor designs. You should go all the way back to the GSM handsets and the Apple Newton of the 1990s. However, over the last decade, a lot of work has been put into the infrastructure segment, including CPUs for servers and high-performance computing. This hasn't simply been about making faster processors, such as Amazon's Graviton 2. Of course, that's been a key part, uh, but just as much effort has been put into the software ecosystem. Initially, that, that effort was all about the open source software stack, starting with the uh, major Linux distributions and growing to include the vast majority of OSS applications that are available today. And then over the past few years, 
we've also been working with the independent software vendor community uh, to bring commercial packages to the ARM server platform. My role at ARM is to, to lead an internal migration to run our own business on ARM-based compute. And so while there's a lot to be done in that space, my focus has primarily been on our engineering workloads. We use a large amount of compute in order to run a fairly small number of tools at scale. And so by enabling these tools, we can move a significant proportion of our estates to utilize ARM architecture of machines. So a major responsibility of my team has been to work with the likes of Cadence and Mentor in the EDA industry to help port and optimize key tools. Historically, EDA software has a multi-platform heritage with tools having run on Spark and other architectures before being ported to x86. So moving to ARM is just another step in their evolution and porting is usually straightforward. Notwithstanding that, a lot of work has been put into optimizing the execution on ARM. The software in the Cadence suite that is supported today on ARM-based servers includes tools such as Excelium for digital verification, Jasper Gold for formal verification, Indargo for debug and vManager for test management. Mentor Graphics currently offers the Questor Advanced Simulator for digital verification on ARM-based servers. We expect to see more tools becoming available over the coming months from various suppliers. However, having tools available from the EDA vendors is only a part of the story. Hardware engineers rely on a flow, which is a software framework that brings together the prerequisites for running the tool, an execution framework that can take the hundreds or thousands of tests that a project might have defined and dispatch them all to appropriate compute resources, and, and then a mechanism to collect the results from all these tests to present back to the hardware engineer. These flows are usually developed by end user engineering teams and can be tightly coupled to the infrastructure that they know and love. So this means that although the commercial tools might be ported to ARM, the flow used to execute them could have incorporated dependencies that are not compatible. ARM is fortunate in that the majority of our engineers use a single flow framework, which has been developed over the past few years to support tools from multiple vendors, and it allows engineers a common way of kicking off their aggression jobs. Because this framework is widely used, there was a single place we needed to focus our internal porting efforts when we first introduced ARM architecture versions of those EDA tools. That porting work required an effort to ensure that scripts used architecture neutral versions of underlying dependencies and to incorporate into the dispatch engine an understanding that both x86 and ARM cores could be requested. Sometimes individual projects had extended the framework with specific customizations, and occasionally these also in included unnecessarily architecture specific code, but the bulk of the work has all been done in a single place. We started our journey uh, by deploying Apollo 70 servers from HPE into our on-premises engineering cluster. So these are based on Marvell's Thunder X2 silicon, which is a processor designed for high performance compute workloads. And it's been integrated into our LSF environment as simply another resource type. What this means is that our engineers have been able to dispatch to this hardware for quite a while, just as they would to x86. And we've been able to develop our capability to run engineering validation work on ARM in conjunction with the EDA software vendors as a result. In parallel, ARM has been working to harness the benefits that cloud computing can offer. And so the amount of compute that we need changes over time. Through the life cycle of a project, more compute is needed towards the end. Uh, and during a day, there will be peaks and troughs in utilization. In addition, we've got some work that is driven by sales activity. And so a large amount of compute can be required at fairly short notice in order to satisfy our customer demand. That means that integ integrating the flexibility of cloud compute into our, our current infrastructure is an obvious way of allowing us to deal with such a dynamic workload more efficiently. However, as I mentioned earlier, the engineering flows can be tightly coupled to that of available in infrastructure, and in particular, to the use of shared storage. And whilst we could have moved our infrastructure into AWS by simply recreating what we have on premises, that would have been an expensive and would not have given the flexibility that we want to achieve. So instead, we decided to re-architect the way that our flows use compute resource. Again, taking ARM's common flow as the basis for this, 
we developed a control layer that balances the need to keep changes to the way that engineers use compute to a minimum while still adopting cloud native principles so far as possible. What we developed allows engineers to submit their workload in a very similar way to how they'd invoke the flow on premises, just changing the, 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 the compute um, resource that they're wanting to use in their, their submission. As a first step, that flow is kicked off within our on-premises clusters and the initial RTL compilation work is done within our own data centers. The output of this is a container which pulls together all of the dependencies that are required to run the flow uh, and which can be sent into AWS as a self-contained object. Using AWS Batch, these containers are then dispatched to spot instances for execution, at the end of which results will be returned to a coordinator service for aggregation. If we find that any tests haven't passed, the engineer is then able to rerun those specific tests within our on-premises estate uh, using a debugging tool, and they can get to the bottom of what caused the failure, fix the bug, and then in the next run, um, see, check that it's been fixed. Since the introduction of the first Graviton-based uh, A1 instances, we've been looking closely at using them in our cloud deployments. With a hybrid cloud-based flow that we have developed, ARM architecture fits in snugly as just another instance type. Our base container images have been built to be multi-architecture enabled so that when a user requests their job to run on ARM, our Thunder X2 based Apollo 70s execute that packaging mechanism, the one that prepares the final container for sending into AWS batch, and it's uh, done on those Thunder X2s rather than our x86 machines in the cluster. Some of our workloads map well to the A1 instance type, and we've got colleagues who are running Cadence's Liberate physical characterization tool who have seen a 40% improvement in cost efficiency over running on the M5 instances that they had previously used. But not all of our workloads were such a good fit with digital verification seeing a more modest 15% cost improvement. More critically, the amount of memory that's available on the A1 instances meant that some jobs would simply not fit within the A1. So the, the launch of the Graviton 2-based M6G instances has overcome those, inst those issues. We have been fortunate to have preview access to those machines, and so we benchmarked a representative set of our EDA workloads. And comparing vCPU for vCPU, the M6G completes one of these EDA jobs in 20 to 30% less time than the M5, depending on the tool in question. Now, and in other words, that means that every M6G 16X large with 64 vCPUs, every one of those that we deploy can do the work of an M5 24X large, which has 96 vCPUs. So that ARM-based machine with 32 vCPUs less is doing the same work as 96 M5 vCPUs. Not only are these vCPUs more powerful than those in the M5, but they also cost 20% less, less per hour. Um, at ARM, with an obvious desire to move to ARM architecture infrastructure, but even if we didn't have that strategic case motivating us, the economics make it clearly desirable to shift as much of our computation onto ARM as possible. We're now well into that migration for our engineering estate, and we've got multiple projects across different groups using our ARM capacity, both on-prem and in AWS. We're already running production jobs on M6G instances. We'll be rapidly growing our use of the platform over the coming months. So at this point, I'll hand over to Dave uh, to talk about Foundry support for cloud-based design. Thanks so much, Tim. I'd like to talk now about what's happening on the manufacturing side of uh, of semiconductor design in cloud and the support in particular that we're getting from uh, foundry suppliers uh, for uh, advanced node design on cloud, enabling their customers to more rapidly innovate and really filling the pipeline for future uh, uh, future uh, advanced technologies on the, on the silicon level. Well, let's start with, uh, with TSMC. Uh, TSMC is the leading pure play uh, uh, fabrication service uh, with uh, greater than 50% market share. And TSMC in 2018 
announced a virtual design environment initiative. And this is very important because this provides uh, fabulous semiconductor companies from startups to, to, to large established firms with an alternative way of developing next generation silicon devices using cloud. And this is a very important um, endorsement of cloud uh, by TSMC, really did help the ecosystem uh, from the EDA vendors to the IP providers to the fabulous semiconductor companies uh, with confidence that uh, that foundries would support the use of cloud uh, for advanced node design, in particular, the use of their process design kits or PDKs on cloud. So very important. Uh, we can provide more information about this in the Q&A or as, as follow-up if you're interested, but it's important to know that TSMC has validated cloud uh, around security and performance, uh, the use of remote graphics and so forth, uh, and has, uh, has really helped the ecosystem move much more quickly and innovate faster using cloud. Similarly, Samsung Foundry, with their SAFE initiative, uh, has also endorsed use of cloud and uh, has worked closely with uh, EDA vendors, including Synopsys and, and Cadence and, and others, to provide uh, reference designs and to validate those reference designs on AWS. This is an example of using Synopsys, their, uh, uh, their reference designs for se seven nanometer uh, flows for Samsung Foundry full flows testing performance, testing the ability to use cloud for interactive workloads and so forth. So again, TSMC, Samsung Foundry, uh, very important that they uh, endorse the use of cloud, that they have um, really helped the ecosystem move much more quickly using cloud-based design. I wanted to quickly touch on some of the solutions that we have at AWS to help with this uh, EDA deployments on cloud. Uh, our Lab126 team, or Amazon Devices team, has developed uh, an architecture for use of uh, cloud-based um, services, instances and servers and so forth, monitoring capabilities. And we have packaged that up as a solution that's available uh, to the open, as an open source project. It's called Scale Out Computing on AWS. There's a link to it here. And this really helps customers get started by creating their own uh, virtual uh, environment on cloud that uh, is ready to be used or modified as needed for various types of EDA and CAE flows. Uh, you're welcome to have a look at that. We've got workshops uh, and training materials around that. It's available on our GitHub repository and follow that link above if you're interested in learning more about scale out computing on AWS. I wanted to quickly touch on the manufacturing side. There's a lot of things happening there, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, in particular, if you think about uh, the drive to zero defect, uh, increasing yields, it's more and more important with advanced node design that you bridge what's happening in the manufacturing side of semiconductor back into the design side. So this, this uh, trend towards shifting left, you know, the idea that you want to identify issues that may impact yields and quality early in the design process, in part by using data that's, that's generated during the inspection and test process, uh, or even during uh, manufacturing, right? For example, uh, wafer images and so forth, right? So use of advanced uh, you know, analytics, machine learning, data lakes on cloud is a big enabler to doing exactly this. Machine learning is beginning to infuse itself throughout the semiconductor design and manufacturing process. Many of these use cases are found in other industries, for example, automotive, general manufacturing, process manufacturing, and so forth, right? And are also found in the semiconductor world. So many of these use cases are enabled by the use of cloud, by the use of data lakes, machine learning services, such as uh, Amazon SageMaker, right? Very, very important uh, set of initiatives uh, at semiconductor firms globally, as well as within Amazon. So we're in complete alignment with customers that want to do more in terms of advanced analytics uh, using cloud-based services. A good example of an organization that's uh, talked publicly about this uh, uh, particular set of use cases is, is Tower Semi over in, uh, in Israel uh, and other firms uh, who are doing uh, wafer production or uh, foundry types of operations on, uh, on wafers are, are finding success with similar use cases. But Tower Jazz spoke about this, or Tower Semi spoke about this at uh, reInvent last year. This particular use case is a wafer defect analysis uh, use case. It's an image processing use case. They're looking for uh, defects such as scratches and, and bubbles and ring defects and so forth 
in the wafers uh, through production to augment human inspections. Very successful for them. They're only getting started with this. Uh, there's We're really at day zero for machine learning in, uh, in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, but we have uh, some good successes with customers across the world that are doing things like wafer defect analysis, uh, yield analysis, uh, process analysis, predictive maintenance uh, across the supply chain, whether it's contract manufacturers, foundries, foundry suppliers, equipment manufacturers. So it's an exciting area to be right now. Uh, much more that we can share about this uh, in the coming months. So I wanted to, to you know, close out here by really uh, emphasizing again that cloud allows semiconductor firms, whether they're fabulous or integrated semiconductor companies or foundries or IP providers such as ARM, to innovate much faster right? Uh, take more risks, run more experiments, right? Get that next uh, advanced silicon product into the, into the uh, manufacturing pipeline faster. And then on the manufacturing side, machine learning, IoT, Industry 4.0, these are, these are uh, very real and they are having impact today on product quality, on speed to market, yields, right? Product cost, uh, really the whole power performance uh, and cost uh, 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 factors can be improved by using machine learning and analytics uh, on cloud. And then collaboration, very, very important. I mentioned this earlier, the ability for the entire supply chain to, in a secure way, uh, collaborate on data, whether it's a, a fabulous semiconductor company collaborating with an EDA vendor, collaborating with a design services organization that's external, or perhaps an IP provider, collaborating with their foundry partner in a secure way using data on clouds. Very, very important set of trends in the industry today. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time today. We've really enjoyed this, this session. Wanted to point out a, a landing page we have, the semiconductor landing page on aws.amazon.com with many more resources, case studies, uh, links to reInvent Talks and so forth, the uh, scale-out computing on AWS, a solution that I mentioned earlier, all available from this semiconductor landing page. Well, let's turn it over now to, to Q&A and transition to the Q&A section. Again, thank you all for being here. Please uh, enter your comments in the chat window and we look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. <laughs> 